Oh. Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the Public Library, Center Mauritius, New York, the 11th of March, 2004, approximately 12.50, 1 o'clock. Uh, the interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Marvin M. Grieve. I was born at uh, Rockaway Beach Hospital, July 22, 1921. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? I finished about two years of college. Mm -hmm. um, where were you and what do you remember about Pearl Harbor, about hearing your emotions, your reactions? We were living in Manhattan. It was on a Sunday. We were listening to the radio uh, with my father when we heard the announcement that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. Do you remember the reaction, your reaction, family's reaction? Well, my father was just astounded by it, and so was I. And uh, the first reaction I had was that uh, I was going to get into this war right away. My father said, take it easy, it's going to be a long war, you got plenty of time. <laughs> I was, uh, well, 19 years old. Did you enlist or were you drafted? Oh, I enlisted. At uh, the time the war started, I was waking, uh, working at uh, Warner Brothers Pictures at, on 44th Street in Manhattan. And I left there and went out to Peoria, Illinois, where my uncle lived and went to work for the Peoria Journal Transcript, the newspaper there, which is something I always wanted to do. While working on the paper, there were three other guys, and we went out and had a beer, and they all said, we're going to enlist in uh, the Air Force because we don't want to get into the infantry. I said, fine, I'd rather fight the war sitting down than slogging through the mud. We went down to the local post office where there was a recruiting station, we took the test, came back two or three weeks later, and said, raise your right hand. And a man who was a major at the time named uh, Speed Chandler uh, put us into the Army, the Air Force. We had 30 days leave, and then I left for Texas, Kelly Field. I went to a flying school at Kelly Field and graduated in a class of 42K and was assigned to fly B-26s and left for Florida for training, for combat training for about three months. Mm -hmm. Now, did you fly in B-26s there? Or? I flew B-26s there, and they were just terrible. We killed more men there than we lost in combat. We lost more men in training. It, uh, the original airplane, it was called the Widowmaker. Mm -hmm. It was built by Martin in uh, Baltimore. It had a 65-foot wingspan, two huge engines, R-2800, right engines, radial engines. It was all power and no wings. And uh, had a gliding angle of a crowbar or a manhole cover, whichever. When you pull the throttles back, it headed for the ground immediately. We uh, were there about three months. We included torpedo training up at the naval base at Pensacola, where I immediately lost a torpedo, dropped it into something, it disappeared, they never found it. <laughs> they said they were going to charge me for it. They never did. Uh, we also did gunnery training up there for the first time with live ammunition. And uh, one day they said, pack up, you're leaving. I flew a B-26 from where I picked it up, and I guess it was in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Flew it to Florida, Florida to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, 
down through Central America, down to South America to Recife, across the Atlantic, with one refueling stop at an island in the South Atlantic, which was three and a half miles long and a mile and a half wide. If you missed it, you had it. There was a German submarine lying off this island about five miles, beeping out the same signal, homing signal that the island was beeping out. It was waiting to kill you over there. Uh, from there we flew to Africa, off the African coast, uh, finally to uh, I can't remember the name of the town now. There was an air base there. We regrouped the squadron and were there about uh, two weeks and then moved up to go into action in North Africa. This was in uh, <coughs> I guess December of 43. Um, now with uh, your crew, did the crew you had then you picked up in, in the States, were you, did you stay together for? Yes, the crew the I picked up time? and we stayed together and we all, we went overseas together. Mm -hmm. uh, the island was called Ascension Island, I think it was owned by the, by the British in the middle of the South Atlantic. Now you were the pilot of the B-26? On going overseas, I was a co-pilot. The pilot was a guy named Tommy Johnson, and I was co-pilot. We uh, moved up in Morocco to an air base that was out in the middle of a field. I think it had been a wheat or barley field, and some bulldozers just plowed a runway through there. We were living in tents and sleeping on the ground at that point, didn't even have a cot. We uh, loaded our own ammunition, 10 rounds at a time, with a thing, you pull the slugs in, you put uh, metal rings on them, and then shoved them <coughs> up together to form a belt. Do a couple of thousand rounds of that. We fueled the planes ourselves, out of 55 gallon drums with hand cranks. So there were no air crews? You didn't have the crew crews. hadn't moved up when we moved up. We had just our own flight crews together. Now how many had a crew of a B-26? Six. Uh, first mission I flew, I looked out and I saw some flak way off in the distance. Puffs of black smoke, little puffs. And uh, nothing happened. We cruised out over the uh, Mediterranean. We dropped some bombs on an island. I didn't see anything. And we came home, and I thought, hey, Warner Brothers could produce a better war than this. On my second mission, I got shot down. And I found out that it wasn't a Warner Brothers war. It was for real. We had gone to uh, an island called Pantelleria to bomb a, a, a harbor base shipping. And there was some flak over the target. We took flak in the port engine on the left-hand side which is belch and smoke, and then six ME 109s showed up. We saw them in a distance and they came at us. We were tail end Charlie and because the engine was really not working right, kept falling back. The more we fell behind, the more the fighters closed up on us. The rest of the squadron kept going across the coast of North Africa, and just as we crossed the coast, to go home, the fighters hit us, and they just raked us from stem to stern. They just shot this thing up like you wouldn't believe it was a sieve. We started going down. Tommy Johnson uh, hit 
the alarm bells to bail out. Lou Boldino was a navigator. He came out of the nose, climbed right over me, went right down the nose wheel hatch. I didn't even get out of the seat. And I got up and went out the nose wheel hatch. Tommy came out almost standing on top of my shoulders. I pulled the ripcord. The chute popped and left me standing on the ground. Tommy came out behind me and hit the ground flat face forward. Uh, he was dead. We walked over and looked at Tommy. His head was kind of in half. I took one of the crewmen with me. Lou Boldino was the other officer. He was a navigator bombardier. He took two guys with him. We split up. We didn't know where, exactly where we were going. We knew the Germans were in that part of North Africa at that time. We hid in a culvert on the side of the road, and a guy in a Model A Ford came by going about 20 miles an hour. I jumped out, waved a gun at him, and he stopped. I had a 45 automatic, everybody wore a gun. And uh, I knew a little French, not much. I asked him where the Germans were, and he said, all over. I said, take us to the nearest village. He said, I don't have any gasoline. Well, a Model A Ford's got a little bobber in front. It's just a, a, a piece of wire on a cork was in there, and you could see how much gas was in the tank. It was about half full. The guy with me ducked down the back. I sat next to this guy holding a gun on him. He took us into a village to a building that said post uh, the telegraphy telephone. It was a post office and telephone office. He told us that there were Frenchmen in there. We went on the back, knocked on the door. A French lieutenant opened the door, said hello. He said hello. He said, we're Americans. We got shot down. We talked a little bit in French. I said, do you know where the Americans are? He said, certainly. He said, we have a switchboard here. He said, I'll call 12th Bomber Command and let you talk to somebody. They plugged me in. I was talking to a guy at 12th Bomber Command on the phone. I told them where we were. We got the name of the village. They said, hang in there. Uh, we'll call you back. Uh, later, This happened in the morning. Later in the day, in the afternoon, I got a phone call. 12th Bomber Command said, we're going to send some troops in to pick you up and we're going to fly you out of there. We stayed overnight. That night the Germans came rumbling through. German trucks full of soldiers kept going by. The next morning we had coffee and some kind of a fried donut. We got a phone call and said the guys are on their way this afternoon. At about one o'clock, uh, I think it was a half track and two other vehicles loaded with about 25 or 30 guys came in and got us out of there, drove us to an air. It was an airfield. It was just a big open piece of ground. They had put down a white cross in the center of it. And... Uh, about 15, 20 minutes later, B-26 of my squadron came in, landed, picked us up, took us home. Uh, it's like we only missed a day of work. Now you, you mentioned three of your crew. Your pilot was killed and yourself and the other person. What happened to the others? The other two were picked up by the British. And uh, they had a, they came back out of a field hospital. That was a British field hospital. How high do you think you were when you bailed out? You must have been pretty close uh, to the ground. I guessed that it was between six and eight hundred feet. Mm -hmm. I think it was under a thousand feet when I got out. I it, the chute just popped, and I was standing on the ground after that. It, I got no ride. So you pulled the cord as soon I as I pulled the cord as soon as I pulled my feet in and started to drop. I pulled the ripcord. I held that ripcord. I brought it back with me. Uh, I'd saved that all through the war. I don't know where it is now. I finally got lost, but I had it in a footlocker for years and years. 
that was uh, the first time I went back to the squadron later on in the war we moved to Sardinia and we were based in Sardinia bombing Italy it was the summer it's around my birthday in July on a raid over Anzio we had uh, two different bomb loads the first uh, wave went in and dropped white phosphorus which will burn your skin and white phosphorus holes down on the ground it doesn't rise it stays down it'll get into fox holes get into all kinds of holes and, and burn you so you have to come out the second wave came in with fragmentation bombs that was us so in driving the German troops out of their foxholes, we came in with frag bombs to kill them. Uh, we had just finished the run and dropped everything and it turned back out over the Mediterranean headed for home. I was telling Charlie, I was a pilot this time in the left hand seat. My co-pilot was a guy named Ollie Kuntz who came from New Jersey, Oliver Kuntz. And uh, the tail gunner called me on and said, here comes the escort that didn't meet us on the way in. I said, great. And the next thing he said, whoops, he said, it's no escort. He said, these are ME 109s. Uh, and then some Fock Wolf 190 showed up. The shooting started. The top turret gunner said to me, we've got a fire around the gas cap on our left wing, on the top of the left wing. He said, I can see blue flame coming out of there. It's gasoline burning. We're about seven or 8,000 feet running for home. The fighters chased us and started to shoot us up. Turret gunner said, that fire is getting bigger. And I said, hang on, we're going to ditch it. I said, I don't want you guys to bail out into the water. We were then maybe 20, 30 miles off the Italian coast. I headed for Palermo, Sicily, which is then about maybe 100, 100, about 100 miles away. I said, hang on. The guys started, I did not ring their alarm bells. The guys started to bail out. The crew started to bail out. And Ollie and I wrote it down. Everybody else bailed out. Well, they tell you a B-26 will float for five to ten minutes when you put them in a drink. It's a lie. When you put them in a drink, they go down like a rock. We blew the top hatches off. There was a big red knob to blow the hatches and also to release a life raft which is in the top of the, of the airplane. I fish tilled it in, the nose dropped down, the ocean came in, we were in water up to our necks immediately, released the seat belts and the plane started to sink right away. We floated up, uh, I still had parachute on and uh, the life raft started to pop out by itself with the air bottles that opened it. We grabbed onto that, floated up with it, climbed in, jerked the string to get it loose. It was on a slip knot from the plane. The plane went down immediately and we wound up on a life raft, two of us. It was around 10 o'clock in the morning on a beautiful, warm, sunny day. We got undressed, laid our clothes. This is a 10 man raft, there were two of us in it. We laid our clothes all around the edge of the raft to dry them out. He and I had been playing cribbage together all through the war. 
he owed me $9 million or something. I had this little deck of cards and a cribbage board in the back of my parachute pack. And we started to play cribbage. We got the May West out, which is a radio that automatically sent out an SOS. We put a balloon up with the antenna. We put a bunch of fishing lines over. There's nothing to do but wait. We're sitting out there looking up at the sky, and there's now a dogfight going on between American P-51s, German M-109s. A German air-sea rescue plane came out to pick up their guys. And some stupid American shot it down. Then more German planes came out. And we had another big dogfight, and guys went down you could only see them when they were up there. When they got near the water, you couldn't see because you're too low in the water. Then, about two hours later, here comes a, an American PBY flying around, which was the SC Rescue out of Palermo. They saw us, we saw them, we waved, we put on our clothes, which were still damp, and uh, they landed, taxied over. They threw us a line. We climbed in, and it turned out to be a British air sea rescue group out of Palermo. They wrapped blankets around us and gave us hot tea. They flew around for about an hour or so looking for other people didn't find anybody, didn't find my crew of three guys in the back who had bailed out. Uh, we flew into Palermo, finally they landed, and we were climbing out a little ladder out there, blister on this airplane, the side window. <laughs> and there was a British major there with a swagger stick and a little mustache standing there, proud as punch. Ali Coons climbed down, looked at the major, he threw him a salute. He said, where the hell have you been? He said, you know, he said, we've been out there almost all day waiting for you. The major kind of died. We were the first people that we had found. They'd been on station three or four months. They'd never picked anybody up. He was just so happy to see us. And Coons said, he said, the service stinks. Let's go. Uh, now, what mission was that? Oh, I was in about 45 oh, okay. some odd missions. And, it, uh, that was July of 43, and I, I came home not too long after. Did they uh, find the rest of your crew? Or no? Never found anybody else. We were the only guys they found. And the same thing happened. A couple of guys from our squadron flew into Palermo, same base, same airfield, who had been shot up a little bit and uh, needed repairs. And we were back that night. We were back with the squadron. When uh, when I got to the 64th mission, I said, I think my luck is running out. I said, I think it's time to go home. And, uh, now, were most, most of your targets in Italy, France, or were they... Yeah, the original bombing started out, we were bombing in North Africa, the Germans there, and then we, we started bombing the islands in the, in the, the Mediterranean. And all of that, the rest of it was all through, for me, was all through Italy. Uh, bridges mostly. Railroad yards mostly. We blew trains, locomotives, bridges to, to interrupt uh, the whole transportation system in southern Italy so the Germans couldn't move anything. I took a little sideline trip. Uh, flew to Naples. We had a courier flight that went to Naples every day. I went to Naples and got a ride to a little town called Pozzuoli. It's where the Troops were going up in little landing ships to uh, Anzio. I had never seen the war on the ground 
and I thought I'd like to take a look and see what was happening. And so I went up to Anzio at night on this little boat that had about 50 or 60 guys on it. They pulled up on the beach and they dropped ladders down the sides. We got off, walked up off the beach to where there was a kind of headquarters. And uh, this was at night. The guy said to me, as soon as it's daylight, he said, find a hole and get in it. He said, because this, this stuff is all open territory. And at daylight, we had moved up and up. But under darkness, we'd moved further up near the head of the line. And at daylight, when you looked around, we were on a big flat billiard table area and surrounded on three sides by mountains. And all the Germans were up in the hills and we were down in this flat area so they could see us. Uh, everybody stayed under cover. I sure glad I wasn't in the infantry, I'll tell you that. When night came, we decided to get out of there. I wanted to go back. The Germans had sent a patrol up. When we started to move back, they could hear us, we could hear them moving around. That's really scared. That was frightening. And uh, we finally got away from them and I got back out to the coast and I got on one of those ships and went back up to Naples. And Next day I was back at the squadron and I decided I was happy I was in the Air Force. That, that was really scary. Now you mentioned you co-piloted were a co-pilot with Doolittle. Oh, after I got shot down the first time, I got three or four days leave. So they, it, the guy was a squadron commander. He's a major, big, rough and tough guy. Always funny. No, he's pure courage. Nothing ever scared him. Doolittle flew in to give us some medals, I guess. And uh, he came in in a B-26, stripped down, had no, no guns on it. And he landed, and we all lined up, and we got the medals, and everybody saluted. And the major said, listen, you're due three days leave. He said, Gerald needs a co-pilot. He said, I'm going to sign you to do a little as a co-pilot. And I said, fine. I got in this airplane with Doolittle. And... Uh, First thing he did was he took off downwind. He had landed from into the wind, turned the airplane around, gave us the medals, and he said, get in, kid. That was it. And he took off downwind, and then he flew through a canyon where there was a military hospital on a high bluff. He said, let's give these guys something to talk about today. He, he flew through a canyon and then came in and landed at, uh, I think it was Algiers. Next day I went out with them and we went and visited another squadron. He did all the flying, I just sat there. He landed upwind, took off downwind, and a B-26 is like kind of an airplane you want to take off downwind with. After that I said, John, I'd like to go back to combat. He said, fine. And uh, <coughs> squadron came into Algiers, one of the airplanes from our squadron came in, I went back with them, and I said goodbye to General Doolittle. I thought he was crazy. He's a little guy, he wasn't very big. I think he, he lived to a ripe old age though, didn't he? <laughs> he lived to a ripe old age, he got shot down in the South Pacific, was on a raft for days and days and days. He. Uh, led the bombers of B-25s that went in and bombed Tokyo, uh, which was all his idea. He, he could do things with an airplane you wouldn't believe and scared me to death. And a B-26 was not the airplane you wanted to play with. It was a man killer. <coughs> but I lived through it. I came back. Uh, 
I had a little incident where when I was coming home, I came back on a from where we were in Sardinia, they put a Jeep in a DC-3. It was a brand new Jeep and it was to be delivered to a general in Italy. I don't know how we wound up with it, but the orders were to take this Jeep to Naples and deliver it to a general who was on the other side of Italy, actually, near the coast. That was it, the flight I climbed on board to go to Naples to come home. When I got to Naples, they were talking about Rome was about to fall. I said, my God, I can't leave here without going to Rome. So I said to the sergeant who was driving a Jeep, I said, why don't we take the Jeep and we'll go for a ride and we'll take a look at Rome before we go home. And he said, no, not me, Lieutenant. I said, no, I'll tell you what, I'll borrow the Jeep and bring it back. Rome is not that far from Naples. Forget it. I took this Jeep and I drove to Rome. The roads were terrible. It took three times longer than I figured. When I got to Rome, I met a couple of guys that I knew, and we met a couple of girls. We went out, and the next thing I know, I drove this Jeep up against a stone wall and pushed the front of it in. Now we had to find a motor pool to put this Jeep back together. It took us two days. Everybody was moving north out of Rome. I found a hospital motor pool to get me the parts, and they put the Jeep together. I brought it back to Naples. A sergeant had reported me to the MPs, but I'd stolen the Jeep. I went through a big thing with the MPs about a stolen Jeep. I said, it's not stolen, it's here. It uh, only showed a little bit that it had been repaired. The sergeant took off in a jeep to deliver to the general, and I was due to come back via ship. I knew if I hung around there waiting for this ship, I was going to get in real trouble. Something was going to happen. So a friend of mine was in charge of assigning crews to fly B-25, what were we, B-25s back to the States. I went to see him. I said, look, i got to change my orders from, it says, via surface vessel. I said, I'm going to wipe that out, I'm going to put down by air. I did that, I gave it to him. He assigned me to a B-25. He said, but you need a crew. I went through the camp and picked up guys who had B-25 flight time. I got a co-pilot, and I got a crew chief, which is all we needed. I said, you guys want to fly home? I said, yep. Went back to him, and they assigned, the next day they assigned me to a World War B-25 to fly back to the States with these other two guys. I had never flown a B-25. I had to call a crew chief to tell me how to turn the switches on and get the thing started. We took it to North Africa. It had a belly tank in it. It was a 250-gallon tank in the bomb bays, a bomb bay tank to give us extra range. From that first field in North Africa, the second place we went, we ran out of gas when we landed because we didn't know that there was a hose connection between that tank and the plane that nobody ever put in. We finally had that put in. We flew that plane back through Dakar, back across the Atlantic, back across Ascension Island into South America, into Recife, and going up the coast, an engine blew. And I think it was in, it was British Guiana. I'm trying to remember the name of the city. Anyhow, we sat there for three or four days, and they flew an engine in a transport. They changed engines. They told us you have to slow time this new engine for five or six hours before you can really rely on it. So we flew up the Amazon River for about two or three hours up and two or three hours back to slow time the engine. 
And then we came back to the States the same way we went, and we landed in Florida. And we're told we'd take this airplane to uh, Kelly Field, Texas, which we did. And this whole trip back, nobody got any laundry done, so we kept wearing the same clothes, taking out the clothes that we had packed, changing to those dirty clothes. We got to Kelly Field, I think we smelled like goats. Nobody had a tie. The MP said, if you're going into San Antonio, you can't get off the base without a tie. I uh, was wearing a 45, which I had worn all through the war, and I had a, a knife that was in right behind the 45 with about a 7, 8 inch blade. It was a hunting knife. I took the knife out, pulled my shirt out, and cut a piece of tail off on a strip and made a tie out of it and tucked it in. And that's how we got into town. Uh, we left Kelly Field. We were processed and given leave. And I reported to a hospital in Atlantic City for a slightly woe-weary, wacky pilots. It was a rest camp, they said. Nobody got any rest. Everybody just drank a lot. They sent me down to uh, North Carolina to a rest camp where nobody got any rest. Everybody drank a lot. And I had to see a psychiatrist every day for an hour. I talked to him. He talked to me. He told me about his troubles with his wife. and He wasn't interested in anything my troubles, and that was how I spent that hour with him all the time. I was there 10 days, two weeks. I was up for reassignment, and before I, on the day, the night before I left, we gave a party up in my room. This was, we stayed at places, a hotel, it was uh, in North Carolina, and I can't remember the name of it. It was up in the Smoky Mountains, a beautiful place. Biltmore? The Biltmore, a huge... Yes, it was a Biltmore. Yeah. I don't know what town is that. Um, it was a... Ash Asheville, North Carolina. That's... You're right. Uh, we went water skiing and uh, played tennis and just loafed around there. It was, it was a dry town. And we drove across the border <coughs> I guess into the next county or to South Carolina. And he picked up two cases of whiskey, three cases of beer, and brought them back to the hotel. And we got a block of ice, two blocks of ice, about 100, 200 pounds of ice, put in the bathtub, a nice big, chopped up the ice, put all the beer in there. And we gave a party that blew the hotel apart. They didn't believe what happened. And I left the next day. It's a good thing. I was assigned to Hillfield, Ogden, Utah, which was a third echelon or fourth echelon maintenance base. They were repairing war-weary aircraft. You could tear them apart right down to the ball bearings in the engines. They could resurface ball bearings. That's the kind of replacement of air base it was. Uh, I was assigned a flight test section. I was a test pilot there, test hopping P-47s, which I had never flown. But to me, an airplane was an airplane. It didn't make any difference what it was. You got in, you cranked it up and looked through all the dials, turned on all the switches, poured the coal to it, and just waited till it started to fly. And they'd come off the ground, you ease back a little bit, and they all flew. And they all flew the same way. They had little quirks here or there, but an airplane's an airplane. So I test top P-47s for a while. I asked to stop test hopping after two things happened to me. One day in a P-47 coming in for a landing, just a little short of the field, I had my hand on the throttle and I pushed it up and the whole throttle quadrant came off at my hand. 
somebody left the bolts out or hadn't tightened them up. I just barely made the field. I just sneaked in. A couple of weeks later, in test stopping a P47, you had a clipboard on your knee, had a whole list of things that you had to do and check them off. And uh, one of the things was you had to roll it on his back you know, and dive it down to the red line. And they were red line at four, 450 or th uh, 350 or 450, I think 450. This time I rolled it on his back and started to get down. And when I rolled it on his back, a piece of metal came across and hit the top of the canopy. It's a bucking iron for rivets that somebody left in the wing. They came loose when I rolled this airplane over, and that damn near killed me. Uh, P-47 had one little quirk. When you rolled them upside down and pulled them through to, out of a, the dive at high speed, the nose stayed down and it would not, you pulled the throttle back when you did this, the nose would not come through the arc to get it back up without giving it power. Everybody's afraid to pour the little coal to it to get it through. One guy got killed doing that. And that's a little trick uh, that you learn about flying P-47s. After that, I started to fly freight in DC-3s or C-47s. And uh, I was the assistant operations officer. The CO said I was a very good pilot. I flew him around for a long time. He was a brigadier general. I flew him all over the area. And uh, I was his personal pilot. He said, why don't you go to command general staff school? He said, you're a bright kid. And you like the Air Force? I said, yep. He said, maybe you want to stay in after the war. They so sent me to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Command General Staff School, Air Staff course. I sat with a bunch of interesting guys. A couple of guys from South America were going through that course, and all the rest were American Air Force officers. And my roommate was a real nice guy. I don't remember his name, but he was he was fun. We always went out drinking at night. After we graduated, I went back to Kelly Field. It was right after the invasion of Europe, D-Day. And then it looked to me like the war was going to be over. So I thought, I don't know if I really want to stay in the Air Force. And I had enough points to get out. You got out on a point system. But if you got out, you had to fly for an airline for a period of time. So I said, okay, I want out. And I went to work for an airline out of Denver, Colorado. I was flying twin-tailed beach crafts. They carried about 12 passengers. They checked me out and I went out, I was co-pilot. Uh, I did this for about three or four weeks. And uh, I'm flying the airplane with my feet on the, not on the rudder pedal, but on the floor of the plane. And the, the plane is fishtailing around and people are getting sick in the back and throwing up. And I got fired. That was great. I went back home. I was, what, separated from the Air Force at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And you had to be stay in the reserve for five years. You had to fly every month for four hours to maintain your rating. I went to Mitchell Field once a month, flew an AT-6 up and down Long Island for four hours. 
everybody else in the squadron had been in the war together and they all knew each other. I didn't know a soul. They went on trips to California and to Florida and to New Orleans and I went up and down Long Island for four hours in an AT-6 once a month. In private life, I was working with my father who was in the antique business and we went, he went to Europe every year or twice a year for, on buying trips. And I had to report to Washington, D.C., to the Air Force to tell them I was leaving the country and going to Europe and that I was going to England and France. They said, uh, wait here, we got a guy who wants to talk to you before you go. Officer came in and said, would you do something for the CIA? I said, certainly. He said, if you're going to Europe, he said, we'd just like you to keep your eyes and ears open, and when you come back, we'd like to debrief you. I said, fine. I went to London. I had to report to the American Embassy. You had to tell them where you were all the time. I checked at the American Embassy. <laughs> the guy sitting there across the desk was a guy I'd gone to command general staff school with. <laughs> He was the Air Intelligence Officer of the American Embassy. He was sitting there cutting stuff out of newspapers, English papers, and sitting next to him was a British Intelligence Officer cutting stuff out of Life magazine and American newspapers on dams, railroads, buildings, facilities. This was the intelligence work they were doing. So we all went out that night and had a good time. Uh, when I went to France, I checked him at the American Embassy. I didn't know anybody there. At, uh, my father had bought a load of antiques, and he left and left me there to see if they got shipped back to the States. I went to the customs in France to get a, a visa, laissez passer, to ship the stuff back. And it turned out that the customs was controlled by the communists in France, and they wanted me to make a contribution to the Communist Party to get the stuff out of the country. I said, no, I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> Finally, I found a guy in Paris that I had known, and he knew somebody who knew somebody. We got the stuff released without giving him any money. When I came back, the CIA debriefed me. And that was a story that I told them of what happened on the trip. At the end of five years, I could get out of the reserve. I went out to Mitchell Field. I saw a major out there uh, and told him my time was up. And he said, do you want to re-up? And I said, no. I said, I want out. He said, OK. And I finally got out of the reserve, and three weeks later, Korea came along, and that squadron, which was a transport squadron, was one of the first squadrons to leave for Korea, and those guys didn't come home for two years. So I missed the Korean thing by pure luck. I guess I had a lucky war. I was never wounded. Uh, when we bailed out, I walked away from it. Oh, Tommy Johnson was killed. When we went down the Mediterranean, we got picked up the same day. I don't know. I got a, a lot of medals for being a very lucky guy. Would you hold this up and, and tell us when and where that was taken, please? <clears throat> I hate to do this because I think I look exactly like this picture today. <laughs> Your hair is a little lighter, huh? Yeah, I, uh, I don't think I've changed a bit. This was taken in North Africa. My uh, best guess is uh, 1943. Okay. Uh, we. We were living in tents, I can tell by the foliage there. So I no. came home and can tell you it was a good war. Okay. Did you ever use the GI Bill? 
Uh, no, I did not. I didn't. I didn't go back to school. Fifty-two twenty club. <coughs> did you ever use that fifty-two twenty club? It's a, like an unemployment insurance for fifty-two weeks. You could collect twenty dollars a week. No, I did not do that. Okay. Um, did you ever join any veterans organizations? Uh, yeah, a friend of mine out here, John Kissel, and we moved out, and we're living here full time. Belong to the. Uh, Was it the American Legion at uh, Eastport? Mm -hmm. So I went over there and joined the American Legion and went to one meeting. And I said, this is not for me. These guys were all sitting around telling war stories. They were all 75, 80 years old like me. And I had no war stories to tell them that I wanted to tell them, and I wasn't interested in their war stories. So mm -hmm. me and the American Legion didn't quite work out together. Do you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? <sighs> Not really. I did for a short time with a, a couple of guys I knew and one of the guys that uh, was at Hillfield with me, uh, Doug Hamilton, came east years later uh, and we sat around and talked to one out to dinner. I, uh, I was in between marriages, and uh, he and I both used to fly out to the West Coast on weekends from Hill Field in Ogden, Utah. We'd each take a P-47 or whatever was loose. We had almost every airplane that the Army had at this air base, starting with a L4 Piper Cub up to B-17s and B-24s. I flew everything on that air base and checked out on everything they had and checked out in a SBD Douglas Dauntless dive bomber, which is a Navy plane, which is wonderful for uh, inverted flight. It had a uh, carburetor that would work upside down. Uh, I flew from from Salt Lake City to Ogden upside down with a, a girl and a, a wave officer in the back seat of it. Uh, she was screaming all the way. It's not that far. It took about 10 or 15 minutes until everybody's head blurred out with red vision. I turned it right side up. And uh, I said, you're going to go out with me tonight? And, and I was climbed out of the cockpit. I was standing on the wing and she was still sitting in the back seat. And she hauled off and slugged me and I went off the wing onto the ground and she said no. <laughs> uh, I was really strange in those days. I was, uh, I was so nuts here that there wasn't anything I wouldn't do. And you thought flying with Doolittle was bad though. You didn't, you didn't I didn't trust him. I, <laughs> Flying for myself was fine. If I was going to kill myself, I would do it, but I wasn't going to let somebody else kill me. And uh, I did a lot of stupid things in the war it, uh, and walked away in one piece. And I have spent 60 years trying to figure out why, why the guy next to me got killed and why I didn't. Why a B-26 in our squadron was hit by flak in the bomb bay and the thing blew up and six guys went blow to smithereens. Uh, why they found me and didn't find anybody else, I don't know. I have never answered it. The only time you get fear is after it happens. When the German fighters attacked us in the sky, you could see their traces, which are kind of green-gray lines. Our traces were red. Uh, when you loaded a, uh, ammunition, every fifth round was a tracer round. There's were green gray in the sky and you could see it coming at you. When a Falk Wolf 190 came at us head on, I thought he was on fire because he was belching fire out of the prop hub, which is where they, they had a, a cannon in there, 
a 40 millimeter cannon, and he had guns in the wings, and the wings looked like they were burning when, when he was shooting. And I pulled back on a stick and got him in my gun sights, and I shot back with the guns that were on the side of the plane, and we had five fixed 50 caliber guns, two on each side, outside of the plane, and one inside in the floor where the bombardier was. And there was one nose gun that the bombardier had that was flexible. It was on a ball pivot. And my feeling was, and I told the crew, when I see gunfire in the sky and I see traces coming at me, I want to hear my guns going. So I put my nose up and engaged this guy in combat and pressed the button and fired everything I had. I didn't hit him, he didn't hit me. But we were sure shooting at each other dead on. Mm -hmm. And I kept screaming all the time. You know, all I want to do is kill that son of a bitch. That was it. I just wanted to kill him. Because he was out there trying to kill me. And that's how I fought the war. That was my attitude for the whole thing. It's the worst thing you can ever do. It's the worst, worst thing that you can ever do is go fight a war. It's the most senseless, idiotic thing in the world. To be killing people. If we didn't do it, we'd all be talking German today. Huh. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much for your interview. You're welcome.